Well, thank you so much for having me, uh, and thank you to Andrea and her team for giving me such a warm welcome today. I've really enjoyed your city and getting to know some of you, and I hope to get to know more of you uh, during and after the talk. So, um, as Andrea mentioned, I've been in London for one year now, but I'm American. You can probably tell from my accent, and so I moved to Europe uh, from Boston, and I've been doing uh, research in the area of consumption and brand management for about 15 years now. It's still my passion even after all this time. Um, and in particular, I do a lot of research in uh, the, the region of Asia and in particular China and India. And some of what I'll be talking about today uh, does relate to, to those regions. But I'm really interested in how, um, how brands uh, are related to social change, and that's a little bit about uh, what I'm going to be talking, um, what what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, so, as you can see, the the title of what we'll be talking about today is the rise of inconspicuous consumption. So, what I'm going to try and argue uh, today, and hopefully I'll see at the end whether uh, whether you agree or not. But as Andrea mentioned. Um, is that although people in the past have argued that the whole reason as to why things like brands exist, in particular in a luxury context, is because we are trying to signal something to others, usually about our status and our place in, uh, in the hierarchy. And that's changing now, not just amongst the elite, where you could argue it's always been there at least part of the time, but amongst society at large. So like I said, I'll see if you, uh, if you agree with me by the end. <clears throat> um, so, <laughs> the, yeah, <laughs> um, I'm glad you find this underwear from the 1980s sexy. So this is from the movie Back to the Future, if some of you are old enough to remember movie from the 80s. Um, but if you remember, the lead character played by Michael J. Fox as Marty McFly uh, ends up going back in time 30 years. Uh, and so when he wakes up in the 1950s, everyone's calling him Calvin. And so as you can see, he says, uh, that's your name, isn't it? Calvin and Klein. It's written all over your underwear. Because in the 1950s, there would be no other reason why you would have a name on your underwear <laughs> unless it was your name. Because at that time, brands were not something that we displayed to other people. And you know, just there was no other explanation. And so of course, then he had to uh, spend a lot of time very humorously telling everyone that uh, his name is not Calvin. But so we see this, you know, so just in between the, the 1950, and this was of course very funny in the 1980s because by the 1980s, brands were everywhere, right? This was the age of excess uh, on Wall Street and um, when everyone was engaging in very conspicuous consumption showing off. So this was in the movie, it was very humorous, right? To see in the 1950s that people didn't understand that this was what brands were for. So let's, um, Flash forward, uh, so to understand this phenomenon, you can look at the concept of conspicuous consumption. So the first person to coin this term and to write about it uh, was Veblen in 1899. So this is an idea that's been around for a very long time. And so the definition that we use in this project, which is taken from him, is that the purchase of expensive goods um, to wastefully display wealth rather than to attempt to satisfy utilitarian needs of the consumer for the sole objective of gaining or maintaining higher social class. This is what conspicuous consumption is, right? So when you're buying a shirt, it's not because you need to cover yourself so that you don't get arrested for nudity <laughs> or because <laughs> you need to wear a sweater because it's cold. No, it's because you are somehow, you're using what is on that shirt to um, display your wealth. And why are you doing that? For the objective of um, gaining or maintaining higher social status. How are other people that I don't know going to know what my social status is unless I display it in some way? And so the typical trend that we've seen, um, well, not just in the 1980s, certainly, but even now, is that for these displays you know, to get larger and larger. So you can see that the, the pictures up here the Ralph Lauren pony, uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, in, actually, in the 1980s, it was that small size. Um, but in the past 10 years or so, the pony has gotten much bigger, right? In particular, in Asia, actually, the larger pony is much more popular. So this is the perfect example of conspicuous consumption. The larger it is, the more people will notice me and the more they will take away um, these signs and signals that I'm trying to send out. It's very straightforward and to a large extent has been the basis of how we understand how and why brands work and how and why people buy things that 
at least on some level, they may not need, but they just want. So what I would like to argue today is that in contrast to this trend, which has been written about from 1899 onward, that the opposite is actually happening and that inconspicuous consumption is on the rise. Um, and so the way that in this project that we define inconspicuous consumption um, in, in line with some other scholars before us is the use of subtly marked products which are misrecognized by most observers. So this part of the definition is really important. There might be something you know, that can be recognized, but only amongst a small group of people who also have the same type of knowledge as you, not amongst society at large. So they're misrecognized by most observers, but they facilitate interaction with those who have the background, the cultural capital to decode the signals. So you can think in many ways, this is somewhat obvious, right? So think about different subcultures, say groups of skateboarders, for example. They will have lots of signs and symbols in terms of stickers on their skateboards or whatever that the vast majority of, of, um, uh, of everyone else doesn't understand what the meaning of those signs and symbols are, but it helps to uh, that group to have a more cohesive bond because they, because they all know and the others don't. So in you, we can certainly think of groups, I think, where this is, uh, where this is quite common. So, but the idea here is that this is now happening on a much more mass and much more widespread level. So this example of Louis Vuitton, which I think is a great one, is we all, they, they essentially, um, gained their reputation at least amongst uh, in the in the luxury category by having their logo which is the l and the v splashed over everything right if you think about a typical lv handbag there's probably 200 gold lvs uh, that are on each one um, this picture that you see right here is the newest lv handbag this one costs about 10,000 euros it's from 2014 um, and this here is an lv but it's very difficult to discern, right? And not just because you guys are in the back and the photo is small. <laughs> it's designed to be that way. So it has, you know, um, a little snake skin on the handle and then that very, very subtle LV, which essentially just looks like a gold clasp unless you're really looking for it. This is just a great example of showing how these signs and symbols are really, uh, are really starting to change and a great example of inconspicuous consumption. So the person who would use this doesn't care if nine out of 10 people who see them don't know it's a, a Louis Vuitton handbag. Now, in some levels, that makes no sense, right? If you're gonna spend 10,000 euros on a handbag, you would want people to know that in some way, right? If they had no way to know that, you could have spent 20 euros on a fake leather handbag, and what's the difference if no one else is going to know? Um, so in some ways, this is very counterintuitive. So what I wanna talk about today is, why would anyone do this? Why would they spend all this money when they're not sending out a signal to other people and where only a few other people will, would be able to understand it? Okay, so essentially, the, the, the main points from today um, are that luxury consumption does not necessarily equate to conspicuous consumption. And again, this is something quite different, I think, to the way that we've thought about concepts of luxury before. So what I mean is that people can engage in what's called luxury consumption. I think the bag we just saw, everyone would probably agree it's a luxury bag, but yet it's not conspicuous. It's not sending signals to a large swath of the society. So those two things are separate. So how can we then understand what is luxury to someone if it doesn't have that connotation of signaling your class and your status to other people. Um, so the second point we've already talked about, signaling only to much smaller groups, and the actual pleasure that people get from, in, from engaging in these purchases and engaging with these brands that aren't sending signals to other people is much more about personal um, pleasure and enjoying your own taste in the company of a small group of others rather than making a statement about you and your place in society to other people. <clears throat> Okay, so what I want to do in the presentation today is outline the three phases of the shift from conspicuous to inconspicuous consumption, then provide three explanations for why this shift has occurred, and then finally get to the so what. <laughs> if we do buy into the idea that this is happening, what does it mean in terms of design? What does it mean in terms of what consumers are going to want and how they're going to relate to brands? <clears throat> okay, so phase one. 
of the, of the three phases is essentially your traditional conspicuous consumption, which relates back to, uh, to Veblen's ideas from the turn of the last century, not the turn of this century, the last century. So this idea that the engine of consumption, the reason why people are consuming beyond just buying food so that they don't starve and giving themselves a home so that they don't freeze in the elements, all of the consumption that, um, uh, that, that, that people engage in for reasons that are not connected to survival. The engine of all that has essentially been the race for class and status. So how we've understood notions of class and status is that there's group um, what you can gain as a person and the context that you're in rather than the signals that you're sending. Um, and uh, this is related to what has been called the lipstick effect. And we particularly see this post 2008 and the financial crisis that, I, I don't know, have we all decided that we're out of the financial financial crisis now? Are we, I think, was it 2008 to 2013 maybe? Uh, we'll, pu we'll put some, some endpoints on it, but um, this idea that people who traditionally had been used to being, being able to uh, indulge in luxuries that were fairly substantial all of a sudden couldn't anymore, but you still want those same feelings that you used to have from being able to, you know, whatever it was, go on expensive vacations or go to spas or whatever it was that um, people indulged in. And so you call it the lipstick effect. Well, I'm going to go buy this really expensive lipstick. It's something, even the most expensive lipstick tip typically won't be over, you know, 20 euros, for example, just because of the nature of the product category. So you feel like you're really treating yourself, but it's in a much, much smaller way. So, um, so again, all of these things, I think, are, are coming together to just show that, okay, we don't, brands really aren't signaling the same things that they used to in the past, and they're not being used for the same things as in the past. Okay, so the second reason that I would argue as to why we are in an age of inconspicuous now, inconspicuousness now, these words are hard to say sometimes, <laughs> is that... Inconspicuousness is the new conspicuousness. There, I said it right. Uh, you know how everyone's always saying, you know, whatever, uh, orange is the new black or whatever. So this is, uh, inconspicuousness is the new conspicuousness. What does that mean? Um, Okay, can brands still signal status? And so what I have here is they can for groups who need them to. There's been re some really, really interesting research that has happened in the US. That, and the, what has motivated this research has been why do a lot of people who are in a lower income category spend money on things that would be categorized as luxuries when they can't necessarily afford to, uh, they can't afford things like education and sometimes even food on a week to week basis. So why would they be spending money on buying a particular handbag or um, buying a particular phone, that, uh, things that go beyond just what the necessities are when they don't have enough for the necessities. And the answer is usually in particular with regards to black and Hispanic populations in the US is that because people uh, look at them in a way that automatically lowers their status just simply because of the racial group that they're in, they feel like to be on an equal footing just in terms of how they're treated in their daily life, they need some signs and symbols around them that, you know, that, that display, hey, I am a person that deserves respect and uh, that uh, has aspirations in life, uh, et cetera. And so they need those signals to show that in ways that if we're looking at it from a racial perspective, that a lot of white people in the US, for example, wouldn't because that would just be assumed about that racial group. So they don't need to spend as high a percentage of their income on accessing those types of uh, signs and uh, those, those types of signaling abilities. So there's this idea that it's, you know, and so the term that's been used is compensatory consumption. We're compensating for what our place in society is um, through this type of conspicuousness. Um, so you're yeah, compensating for your lack of power. So you see all these examples from different studies, like um, in terms of racial groups, blacks are more likely to name their children with names like Harvard or Lexus <laughs> compared to other racial groups. And, but you can see this, uh, and yeah, you, yeah there, those are just a couple examples, but uh, it's a great study in the, 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 the types of brands that are, uh, that are looked toward in terms of what to name your children is quite, quite interesting. 
Um, but you, can, you see it outside the context of the US as well. So for example, lower status groups in India actually spend a much larger percentage of what their overall chunk of money is on lavish weddings compared to, uh, compared to groups who have more money for that. So it's the same principle. This notion that, um, uh, that there are still particular groups who do need to make signals, but if you're not, or need brands to give signals like this, but if you're not in one of those groups, you don't necessarily have the same need for conspicuousness. Um, so this same idea you could apply at the macro level in terms of their particular countries, right, who have less resources compared to other countries and where there's innate biases against them, in particular from a country of origin perspective, right? So the idea should be as nations become more wealthy and become more um, uh, solidified in their standing in the world, their level of conspicuous consumption should also be shifting. Um, and I would definitely argue that in China this is the case. China has always been the poster child for conspicuous consumption. This is, you know, it's the number one luxury market in the world, and it's the, it's where, you know, that shirt that I showed you with the Ralph Lauren pony, that is the market for which the pony that is six inches wide was designed for. Um, there, you know, it's the, always been the poster child for just uh, what would be considered in many other places really nouveau riche uh, brand consumption. Um, but there's all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of studies coming out now. One that I really like is that consumers have begun removing labels from their clothes because they don't want anyone to know what brand it is. And there's a lot of uh, complex reasons surrounding that in China. So for, for example, not to get too far off track and talk about geopolitics, but you may know that the new president of China has uh, really vowed to crack down on corruption and most people who are employed by the government, their official salary is quite low. Um, but they live very well <laughs> because the bulk of their salary comes from sources that are uh, not necessarily, what word should I use? Not necessarily official sources, there we go. <laughs> um, and, but they cannot, but now that there's a crackdown on uh, on corruption, you cannot be seen to have any trappings around you that might indicate you're living above your means, and your means being what your official salary is supposed to be. So there's this desire to have nice things, but to make sure that other people around you don't know that they're nice. And so even to the extent of tearing out, you know, tags from, uh, from your clothing. Um, and so, yeah, this is the government corruption in the last point, but also the, since the financial crisis um, post-2008, you can argue that this has been happening in lots of places. When there are a lot of people whose quality of life has suffered in the past five years or so in terms of gone down, you don't want to be seen as being insensitive to that by flaunting your wealth, so that's been uh, another reason. And this third bullet point, though, I think is quite an interesting one. There, so this uh, study that's cited there looked at, in particular, the, uh, this, this was in Japan. 94% of women owned a Gucci handbag and 96% of women owned a Louis Vuitton handbag. So how much are you actually standing out by using those brands? Not at all, right? <laughs> if literally every single person around you, out of this whole room, it would, what, be one or two of us who didn't have one. Um, you know, you're not, you're not actually standing out from anyone else in any sort of distinct way by using those brands. So choosing to do something different, actually, so choosing something that is more inconspicuous actually makes you more conspicuous. Does that make sense? <laughs> it makes you stand out from the crowd to a larger degree, which I think is a great example of this, uh, of this second point, which is that inconspicuousness is the new conspicuousness. Okay, and, it, and so just a quick example of this, I thought um, some brands, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with these brands or not, they're starting to come to Europe, um, but these are essentially two brands that are, can, well, that are, I wouldn't say that they're Chinese luxury brands yet, but they're the two who have aspirations well, to be global luxury brands, let me put it that way. They are two Chinese luxury brands. They have aspirations to be the first Chinese luxury brands. The first one is called Shanghai Tang. Um, it's owned by the Richemont Group, who owns Cartier, um, 
uh, and yeah, other brands. And um, they, they were the first, I would argue, luxury brand in China. Um, they started about 15 years ago and they sell all sorts of clothes and accessories and things like that. You can tell from just from their logo, which I have up there, that they are a fairly, how should I put it, conspicuous and loud brand. <laughs> they have bright colors. Um, they pull on a lot of uh, traditional Chinese imagery. So you will always see, um, yeah, things like um, the, the, Chinese, uh, the, the Chinese lettering at the top, um, you can even see some of the communist stars. They, they pull from uh, very uh, uh, almost stereotypical Chinese uh, imagery. Uh, a big part of their target segment is tourists who go to China and want something to bring home that shows I've been to China, but that also isn't too foreign to what they know. Um, and the brand has not been doing well recently. Uh, and there are a lot of people that their clothing will be very bright. Uh, like I said, it will always have, you know, very large prints on them. It's a very, yeah, conspicuous and loud brand, I guess, if you want to describe it that way. And it, like I said, it has not been doing well recently. And a lot of people think that the reason why is because it's going against this new trend of inconspicuousness that I'm trying to argue is what, what we're in, the, the state that we're in now. So the next brand that you see next to it was started by Hermes. I'm sure you know them. Um, and it was started in the Chinese market. It's pronounced Shangja. And uh, they had just opened their first store in Paris, actually. So they have come to Europe. Um, but this is entirely opposite. And you can tell from the logo, right? It's very, very understated. Um, it's very subtle. It is trying to give across uh, a notion of harmony uh, and elegance. And nothing that they make has a brand on it at all. You would never uh, uh, be able to know overtly that it was Shangsha. Uh, everything is handcrafted, and that is what their notion of luxury is, is about, that this is something that an actual person made. Um, and the amount that people pay, that you, they make uh, not only clothing and things like that, but also furniture and much larger ticket items is insanely expensive. This is one of the most uh, expensive brands I've ever seen. Um, and it's becoming hugely popular. And it absolutely fits into this trend that I'm talking about here. So not only in China, but also, like I said, now they're in Europe and they have uh, aspirations to be a global brand. So I think this is a perfect example in terms of the comparison between the two to to, uh, to, to illustrate what we're talking about. Okay, so the third, uh, the third reason here, I said, the, or the third explanation for why we're in an age of uh, inconspicuousness is this point that I made before about design. So this notion that designs that are complex, that are sophisticated, understated, effortless, uh, sense of exclusivity are the type of design uh, uh, properties and aesthetics that consumers are responding to now. So this idea that brand strength and attractiveness are not necessarily delivered through share of voice. So I don't know if um, a, lot, I know you, a lot of you guys are students. I don't know if you've been introduced to the concept of share of voice yet, but it used to be the idea that if you're a brand, you want to have the highest share of voice that you can. What that means is that you want to be a part of people's conversations, the cultural conversation that is happening um, on TV, what people are chatting about on Facebook, the YouTube videos that people are forwarding each other, hey, check this out, what people are talking about on a daily basis. The more they can be talking about you and the larger share of, of people's voices that you have, the more you will enter people's consideration sets, become a part of their daily lives, people will form connections with the brand, et cetera. So that's typically taught as part of um, best practices with regards to how to manage a brand. Well, now I would argue that this isn't necessarily the case anymore. Wanting to always be a part of people's conversations and constantly being as loud as you can in order to be a part of those conversations um, really isn't really isn't what people are, consumers are looking for anymore. So this idea of nuanced minimalism, um, allowing for greater private pleasure as well as brand transcendence and an ability to, for people to create forms of, uh, new forms of cultural capital that they can use in their social groups are really what people are looking for um, from luxury brands now. So 
Just some examples for you. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Selfridge's department store in London. It's a very uh, iconic department store and very, very beautiful if you haven't been there. And there's a great TV show. It's actually an American TV show about Selfridge's, which I also, uh, which I also recommend. Very interesting for you. I'm sure that everyone here is interested in marketing and branding. And it's a very interesting take uh, on those issues um, done in a dramatically interesting way. But anyway, in London's, uh, in Selfridge's, Suffrages, they decided to take out all price tags and they don't organize things by brand anymore. It's uh, when you go in, there's like a personal shopper to help you, uh, to help you shop. Oh, what are you looking for? What experience would you like to have while you're here? And so it's not about um, the, the, the typical drivers in terms of... Um, yeah, in terms of what brand, you know, they obviously stock a huge variety of brands, but they don't merchandise it in the same way. They merchandise it in a much more inconspicuous way in comparison to similar other department stores around the world. Um, in China, they're... Um, the, the new generation, the, the Chinese youth, um, are very much at the forefront of this, uh, of this movement uh, towards inconspicuousness. And normally, I think, well, I'll ask you guys when we discuss, and you can tell me what you think, but I feel like intuitively people think, oh, it's older people who want this notion of sophistication and subtlety, and the youth want, or still want to be able to tell everyone, hey, I'm here in some sort of loud way, and tell people who they are in terms of their own identity, etc. Um, well, we could argue whether that's true anywhere around the world, but in China, there's definitely been some interesting research that shows it's the opposite. It's the younger group that is driving this, um, and they have this word, uh, tu hao, for people who do still engage in the type of conspicuous consumption that we associate with China. Um, and uh, the rough translation, or well, maybe my American translation would be hillbilly. You know what I mean? That, that, that concept of like someone who lives in the country and doesn't really know uh, how, what, what, how to consume or how to look. Uh, so that's what the two how would refer to people in that way. Um, and then the final point, which I think is an interesting one. Um, so there's been some interesting studies about these subcultures of hipsters. And if you're a hipster, you don't want to use all of these very well-established luxury brands, right? That's not what being a hipster is all about. What being a hipster is all about is using better versions of mundane products. So I'm going to eat a tomato, but it's going to be an heirloom tomato. I'm going to eat chicken, but it's a free-range chicken named Tom, and I know exactly how he grew up <laughs> and who took care of him <laughs> and all of that. So this idea that you that what, what has more cachet in the marketplace is consuming something that's relatively mundane that most people would be familiar with um, and that could access, but in a more, uh, but, but, in a, but in a different way. Uh, so more sort of an, an elite version of something that's mundane rather than simply saying, oh, I'm not eating tomatoes or chicken, I'm eating and foie gras constantly. No, that's no longer what people aspire to do, right? They aspire to eat the fancy version of the mundane consumption. So I think that's quite, uh, quite interesting as well. And again, from a design standpoint, has a lot of implications about what, uh, what people are looking for. <clears throat> Okay, so those are the three reasons, and then we just have two slides. This, now we get to the so what. So why, why is this important, or why does this matter? Well, Veblen, is, his ideas have been around for quite a long time, so I think uh, rethinking his conceptualization of conspicuousness and why it exists is something that is fairly meaningful uh, to do. Not, not to say that he's that his concepts weren't right, and I think they are still very useful in some situations, but not in others. So I think rethinking when is conspicuousness going to be used and why and by who um, is quite useful. Uh, reconceptualizing luxury. So this idea, you know, inconspicuous brands are less likely to be counterfeited. I think to a lot of brand managers, that's something that's quite important. If something can't be imitated, um, that gives a lot of value from a design uh, perspective. And also, when you have inconspicuousness, there's this argument that it can diffuse the envy uh, or the social comparison that tends to drive this keeping up with the Joneses type of, uh, type of behavior, right? If you don't even know what it is that your neighbors are doing because you can't decode the signals, then you are not 
trapped in this cycle of constantly trying to keep up with them to be happy. Um, happiness studies, by the way, is a very interesting area, uh, typically of psychology, but I think it's quite related to a lot of these issues in terms of branding and consumer behavior. What you, what's been shown in happiness studies is that the relationship between happiness and your, um, uh, uh, not level of income, but your lifestyle is an inverted U. So in other words, the, more you, the better your life gets in terms of what you can afford, the happier you get to a certain point, and then it becomes the opposite. So why, when you get more than, you know, than to a certain point, does your happiness go down? And a lot of people will explain that inverted U relationship because you're constantly engaged in social comparison when you're on this side of the U. Yes, you have enough to live a very comfortable life, but then you're con now you're introduced to a new world and you're seeing all these other people who live an even more comfortable life than you and you can't be satisfied with what you have. So there's this idea that with inconspicuousness, maybe some of that will, some of that type of social comparison will start to go away and people can be perhaps more satisfied with what they have. Um, and then this final point here is that this idea that only the elite would be able to appreciate these signals, uh, I don't really think that that's true. And I think that we've seen, like I said, with regards to the youth in China, it crosses generations and it crosses social classes, I think. Um, okay, and then finally, from a managerial perspective, um, a lot of people will ask me when I present this, well, are you saying that all brands are going to change like this? Uh, not necessarily. If we look at Mercedes, for example, and again, uh, I keep going back to China because it's a context that I know quite well. In China, in many ways, Mercedes is becoming more conspicuous. They're increasing the size of their, um, what do you call those things on the front of the car? Name badge? The, yeah. Sorry, yeah, whatever those are called. You guys know what I mean. They're actually increasing the size of that, but they're also coming out with a new brand called Denza, which is gonna be totally inconspicuous and not have any branding uh, and be even more expensive than Mercedes in that marketplace. So what we tend to see is a balance between the two within portfolios. Um, I would argue that over time it will shift more to inconspicuousness, but I don't think it's necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, so I really like this example. This is a picture of a Tesla, and this is the T. A lot of people will say they don't even know that that's a T. <laughs> it looks sort of like some sort of V type of thing. Um, but Tesla gets a lot of criticism for not being recognizable. That, oh, well, people can't even tell, you know, that it is a Tesla. And from a brand management perspective, they get a lot of, um, oh, you're not managing your brand correctly, uh, and a lot of criticism in the press. And so I use this example to motivate the, uh, the, the, the statement that I would like to, uh, to end the presentation on. So JP Morgan said, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. <laughs> I don't know if you know that, uh, if you know that saying or not, but it's uh, quite, quite a famous one in the English speaking world. And I would suggest that in the future, if you have to ask what brand it is, you can't appreciate it. So in that sense, Tesla not being unrecognizable, I think will be, uh, you know, it should be a good thing, right? Tesla should say, well, if people can't recognize the subtle signals we have, then they're not a person uh, who, you know, who would be in our target segment for who we're trying to reach anyway. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I would love to hear your thoughts and uh, answer any questions that you might have. Hmm.